Hi, everybody. This is Dave Vellante of Wikibon.org, and uh, we're here in the Marlboro headquarters, and we're talking continuous availability and data at a distance. It's an important topic. I mean, we've all seen the recent disasters, uh, the Hurricane Sandy. We had a big snowstorm here uh, last week in New England, and it's top of mind for people uh, with businesses going 24-7 and, and commerce happening more and more online. Um, it becomes increasingly important for organizations to think about how they architect and how they construct systems that essentially don't ever go down. And we're here with Matt Allen. Uh, to my right is Matt Allen, who's the Senior Director of Security and Risk Management uh, at EMC Global Services. And to his right is Matt Waxman. We've got the Matt Show today, who's the Senior Director of VPlex Product Management. Matt and Matt, welcome. <laughs> one Matt is two T's, one is one T, inside joke, but you get it. Thanks very much, guys, for coming on to theCUBE. Thanks for having us, Dave. So we have this topic, and it's, a, it's an evolving one. I mean, we've always talked about uh, you know, high availability, even continuous availability. I mean, after 9-11, I mean, I know EMC played a big role with uh, SRDF and a number of your clients uh, being able to recover and keeping the financial system. But we're now you know, 10, 12 years on, and uh, there's a lot more data, a lot more pressure, a lot more risks to business. And you guys have made an announcement, uh, I guess yesterday, in this regard. So why don't you guys take us through the announcement and then we can get into the discussion. Sure, so the announcement is the formal announcement of us rolling out a service offering that's designed to help our customers better understand um, not just what their infrastructure requirements are to achieve something re referring to as continuous availability, um, but what it would take from a roadmap perspective to achieve it over an extended horizon, what the cost and benefit um, kind of elements of that investment decision would be. So for context, continuous availability is a service level that's created by infrastructure application architectures that have no single point of failure, okay? So at some level, um, the component, the application, or site levels are always up, always moving, always operating. Okay, so, so the announcement is specifically a services offering, um, um, and, and, and so it's an ass assessment service. Uh, you're saying also included in that is a business case? Uh, uh, outcome is that right? That's correct. So, so, a so yeah, tell us what the client yeah, yeah, gets. Sure, yeah. sure. A couple of a, a couple of different offers. Um, one is a current state assessment to get a view of what their needs are from both an application and an infrastructure readiness perspective. A roadmap that gives them some sense of what it will take to achieve continuous availability or a continuous availability architecture, an active active architecture, which, which Matt will talk about a little bit in just a second. We're also going to help them better understand what the operational um, requirements are from a continuous availability, availability perspective. One of the things we'll cover today as we talk about this is the, the fundamental changes of operational requirements that most of our clients, most of our customers are having to engage in when investing in this journey. It's not simply a fundamental different view of backup or disaster recovery or business continuity. It's a fundamental economic shift in the way they run their businesses. And so from a transformational perspective, there are a series of different requirements. It's not just technical anymore that, that they've got to consider. Our services are designed to help them with that. Okay, so I got a number of questions in that regard, but um, Matt Waxman, I want to go to you for a minute. Um, you're a product guy, uh, but what are, the, what are you seeing in your product is obviously you know, a fundamental component of this offering. What are you seeing as the drivers of this continuous availability movement? Yeah, so, so um, it's a great question. <coughs> the, the shift is really happening around uh, people looking at automation. Really, when, when you look at the, the transition to the cloud, right, a core component of that is automation and simplification. And when you look at traditional models of managing two data centers in an active passive manner, um, it relies heavily on scripting and tooling and people, right? There's a significant OPEX um, that's involved with that. Uh, what we've seen is that this shift to continuous availability really moves that to a fully automatic model. Literally, no scripting, right? No human intervention. It's things just continue operating, right, in your second data center. So that's really what's underlying this transition, I think, is, is people relooking at the models, the admin costs, the asset utilization, we can talk about all those things, the great benefits of doing this, but it's really this shift to a completely automatic infrastructure. So one of, in reading your press release, one of the things that strikes me is your, some of your messaging was around bringing together uh, uh, production systems, high availability, and disaster recovery, sort of a consolidated view of, of those three. Am, am I interpreting that correctly? Is that sort of the thrust here? 
I, I think it's, yeah, it's a, it's a fair conclusion to draw. I, I think, hopefully, what we've articulated is that there's been a journey that all of our clients, everyone in the marketplace has been on from sort of disaster recovery on the left hand of the spectrum to more advanced applications, exactly the way, the, the way Matt framed it up, um, that, that is a more advanced version of what continuous availability or an active, active environment needs to be. Um, there's, a, there's an important distinction here, though. The difference as it relates to what we've traditionally view, viewed DR to be is a lot of redundancy, a lot of complexity. Matt sort of touched on it, but the, the reality is it's not just extra pieces of technology, extra pieces of product, but rather extra effort from a people, process, and technology perspective. With continuous availability, that is eliminated in most instances. Well, so we're talking about a material change in cost model. And, and the mental model, too, because, uh, I mean, I would observe that typically, you know, except for the obvious applications, things like disaster recovery oftentimes, even, even backup sometimes, is a bolt-on. It's like, oh, hey, we could right. deploy this application, and we we got to protect it. Yeah. And so, all right, what do we do? And maybe we'll replicate it, and, and maybe we'll do a good job, maybe we won't. We do some scripting. Can we talk about the options that customers have today? Sort of paint a picture of where we are today and where you guys want to take us. Sure, so, so I think it, it's really um, best to think about it as a spectrum, right? Uh, like Matt said, you know, on the left side you can think of DR, right? And then you have high availability, which is another layer in between, and then continuous availability all the way at the other end of the spectrum. We see customers needing a mix of all those things. It isn't to say that continuous availability is the answer for everyone. Um, but it's a model that is transformative, right? It, it is a different model than DR. Um, what we see also is the opportunity to actually blend the models. So uh, what we've done over the past year or so uh, with the VPlex product is we've actually integrated it together with our recover point offering as well. And what that's given us is the ability to combine both a continuous availability story together with a DR story. We see a lot of customers wanting to do that where they have regional requirements for continuous availability and outer region for DR. So it's really the best of both worlds. So I, I think of um, things like DR, and, I, and, I'm, and, I, and I'm imagining like a three-site data center. And I'm going, ah, oh, <laughs> I can't afford that, or it's too complicated, or my people would never be able to you know, manage that, or they'd shoot me if I tried to put that in, or my CFO would kill me. So that's kind of the one end of the spectrum. Um, and I also, uh, in looking at press release, I inferred that sort of RPO and RTO, you're trying to move beyond those concepts, but it used to start with the uh, notion of RPO and RTO. If I wanted, you know, as near zero data loss as possible and super fast, you know, re recovery times, I might go to that three site, but a very small percentage of the people can actually afford to do that. So are you now opening capabilities up to the masses, or, or does this essentially replace that methodology? Talk about that a little bit. Well, I, I think there's a couple of ways to look at it, but I, I think first and foremost, in our release, and I, I hope that everybody uh, understands that we all view um, you know, a continuous availability architecture, an active-active architecture as a, as a journey to get there, to, to Matt's point. There are several different types of configurations um, that, that different clients will have to engage in for whatever period of time um, because of you know, the different or unique requirements of their infrastructures. The compelling difference now, the reason this is such a, a, an important story now is for the first time, and in, in, you know, since we've really gone down this um, you know, scale journey around disaster recovery, we have off-the-shelf technology to, to answer the solution. So, so heretofore, this has been a wildly expensive alternative, in fact, prohibitively expensive, in the context of cost of uptime or cost of preventing a failure. So achieving some level of five nines of uptime, that sort of thing, has been cost prohibitive, largely because we just didn't have off-the-shelf technology that gave our customers or the broader marketplace an, an immediate answer to the need for an active-active environment. With VPlex, we get that off-the-shelf technology at an effective price point in a way that the economics can be fundamentally changed. And that you'll see accelerate rapidly in the near term. So I want to talk a little bit about distance, uh, because distance has often required trade-offs, right? If I'm, if I'm synchronous, great, I get the performance and the low latency, but I'm subjected to the, you know, the, a fire or a building blowing up or a terrorist act. So I go to an asynchronous distance, and then 
it becomes problematic because I'm, I'm, I'm increasing my, my RPO. Um, so are, are, am, am I to understand that you guys are essentially rationalizing that trade-off with these offerings? So um, <clears throat> I, I would look at it slightly differently. I think that continuous availability and RPO, if you will, or non-zero RPO, like you're saying, mm -hmm. are a little bit at odds with each other, right? Um, by, by definition, being able to run active-active in two locations in the ultimate case of, uh, you know, reads and writes happening at two sites um, and then having failures in between and truly having a continuous availability model with that is, is, is still an unsolved problem, right, in, in computer science. Um, and it has a lot to do with the speed of light. Um, I hear you guys are working on that, though, deep in the labs. So. really hard on that, <laughs> and we'll let you know soon. We'll be back up here as soon as we have it solved. Come on, Google, help <laughs> us out here. <laughs> but, but for sync environments, right, for the regional campus level, metropolitan level, right, there's a ton of that going on. And, and what we're seeing is that with the consolidation of data centers, um, right, into, into larger footprints, you end up with uh, actual failure domains within the data center, right? So you have fire cells, you have different floors in the data center that are treated as if they're virtual data centers. And it makes a lot of sense. We have a lot of customers that are deploying this really within the same physical footprint, right? But it's providing the same capabilities and resilience that they're looking for, you know, traditionally between a campus or between two metropolitan data centers. So is that, when you do talk about the services, are you primarily focusing on that metro sort of synchronous distance type of problem or? Yeah. Yes, it, it, VPlex Metro is the backbone to, to yeah. the way we're thinking about this. And yep. it is for, I think for our purposes as it relates to engaging with our clients, um, the, the basis for the conversation. But, but in the interest of sort, sort of going out a little bit further as it relates to some of that, you know, altering the way we think about, about disaster recovery, to specifically answer a question you had, I, I'd love to see at some point where we just stop considering RPO and RTO and do, doing a business impact analysis is altered in such a material way that you would not do it in traditional fashion. That's our objective. So uh, let's just talk about that a little more because I have a question. I, I had a note about a BIA. Do I, is that what you're doing? You're going in and doing a business impact analysis? Because when you do that, you always have the RPO, RTO conversation. How much data are you willing to lose? And business person says, what are you talking about? You know? Right, right. Until so. you start talking about the cost of what it'll be right. to actually get all of the data. Right, then all of a sudden, ah, plenty, a right, uh, right. full day maybe. Sure, sure. <laughs> you know? then, then you change your mind. The, the reality is, as it relates to those, those items, those are a traditional business continuity view of the world. Right. I would like to think, and, and I think aspirationally where we want to be with continuous availability is helping our clients move well beyond that construct. So the idea that they're thinking in terms of recovery time objectives in a traditional sense, sort of a way of the past. Way of the future is going to be more about how seamless is the switch, how little is impacted, and how you know, you know, minuscule are the changes that they experience as a result of some level of, of failover or, or engagement of an active active uh, architecture. Okay, so um, given that you're not necessarily prescribing the parlance of traditional RPO, RTO, what kind of language are you using when you go in and do these assessments? So, so everybody's got to forgive me a little bit because unfortunately I spent enough time around the insurance guy, so I'm trying hard to get away from, the, away from that language. I think the way to think about it is we'll talk about um, what I would call the top end of the spectrum of cost of uptime. So, so it will very much become a nuance of um, the cost that one or a company is willing to bear relative to an extension of five nines of uptime, that will be a function of business need. So transaction support, use of data, the value placed on accessibility and use of data going forward will be the compelling part of the discussion rather than just I need something, an application within you know a two day span or a one day span. I, I think you'll see more of a how do I prioritize which decisions are made when and which transactions are supported immediately or in a slight delayed, uh, delayed setting. You know, that's an interesting point because in all my years of, of following this type of, of industry activity, and it's always been fascinating to me, you hear people say, well, you got to speak in the language of the business. And then they turn it to an RPO, RTO discussion. And I don't know a lot of business people that, that even understand what RPO and RTO is. And what you're saying 
Matt Allen, if I understand it, is we want to talk in terms of the value of the application, the business process maybe, you exactly. know, that, that, that touches that application and how critical it is to the business, how much revenue it drives. I mean, sure. are those the types of discussions that you're having with, with customers? Those are exactly the conversations we're having with our customers. And I think um, you, you hit on the point of all of this, our release and the backdrop of the continuous availability offering, the, the set mm -hmm. of services and, and frankly, the way we're lining up with Vplex Metro. The idea is to alter the discussion, move away from simply a technical answer to a technical problem, and into a discussion of business problem being solved by a combination of technical solution and process redesign and or you know, you know, reconstructing a business need over a, you know, a different expanse of, of problems that we're trying to help our customers solve. In this instance, we, I think for the first time, get to see the convergence of both technology and business need, and mm -hmm. frankly, just timing as it relates to clients and or customers' needs. The backdrop to this, no matter how you cut it, and, and I, you know, I sort of gloss over the need to talk about RTO and BIAs and that sort of thing, but the reality is every customer, no matter which customer it is, needs their data in a way they never have before. The hockey stack, you know, growth as it relates to their dependence, their need, and their consumption of data has never been the same, and it's never going to be the same. It's going to continue to grow. Their need for uptime is only is only accelerating. It's not going to alter. You can't go back. So in this instance, it's very much a business solution that we brought a technical, I, I think, a very specific, specific technical solution to a business problem in a way that. I, I would argue I haven't seen a solution like this since I've been engaged in you know roughly 20 years of consulting in this area. So I want to dig into the solution a little bit more. Matt Waxman, my question to you is you mentioned recover point before. So instantly I'm thinking about dialing up or down the level of service that's required based upon my, my business need, the discussion that we were just having. So I, I presume recover point's part of this uh, offering or not necessarily, or how, how's that all fit? Yeah, yeah, actually before I get to recover point, I just wanted to add one more point um, to the previous conversation, which is Please. I, I think um, a little bit of the history of how we got here um, adds some color, which is um, we've been out having the VPlex conversation now for a couple of years mm -hmm. and getting great adoption of the technology, but, um, but what we've seen is that it actually triggers exactly this conversation, which is, Yes, it's really important that I address this from a storage perspective, but I really want to look at how I transform my business right, into a model of, let's talk about uptime. Let's stop talking about RTO and RPO as a technical element. Let's talk about uptime. And what that's um, driven is obviously creating the service and the consulting around it, but the conversations that we're having with customers now are about, tell me how to build this solution, right? What do I need in terms of load balancers? What do I need in terms of infrastructure? what apps are best suited to it. It's a totally different conversation than a, let's talk about just the storage infrastructure. So I think that's an important context around it. Right, and, that, and, and, and essentially you're, you're taking a services view of it. It's, you know, in this world of everything as a service, you're talking about availability as a service or, right. or recovery as a service, yeah. or I mean, uptime as a service. Yeah. I mean, I'm maybe inventing a new term in the fly here, but talk about uh, that notion, because I'm, I'm assuming that what it allows me to do, let me put the premise forth, is I can then tailor the service for the application of the business requirement, and my, my service level and my consequent uh, costs are going to be affected by that service level that I choose, and you can, as I said before, dial up or dial down. I presume recover point is a key part of that flexibility, yeah. and obviously the substrate here is, is VPlex. Right, right. So, so on the recover point piece, what's really interesting about recover point, right, there's, there's two core aspects to recover point. One is around disaster recovery, which we've been talking about. Yep. The other is around operational recovery. And operational recovery is all about, um, in the case of a corruption, a great example, right, or a virus or that type of thing, how do I dial back, to your point, to a point in time where I knew I had a good uh, image, right? And operational recovery applies to continuous availability the same that it does apply to disaster recovery. Right, so the, we see a lot of synergy there between Recover Point and VPlex, and that's why we built the integration that we have. Um, not just because of the DR component, but the operational recovery too. So as you build out these services, how do you envision the service level agreements changing in terms of what the organization, what the IT organization is committing to, to its uh, customers? How is that discussion going, and what do you predict there? 
I, I think there's there's an immediate response that I'm seeing. The um, it's one of expectations management. Um, what's realistic to achieve in the near term? What's more of a you know an extended roadmap? Um, what are the requirements that are going to be imposed on the IT organization going forward to fulfill to help the business fulfill their objectives? Um, for, for me, that's a balance that you always see. I, I think the IT component of the organization having to to manage. With continuous availability, you'll see that enhanced. I think it, it's like almost anything from a technical perspective where application functionality is added in a, in a way that adds to or enhances the business, it helps transform the business, um, the expectations only grow. It makes the IT, the IT side of the house a, a little bit more difficult to manage, but I think the reality is the solution set is now advancing in a way um, that it is practical and you'll see the client and or the broader marketplace uptake this conversation away in, in a way that they just haven't in the past. Yeah, I, I think um, you know one way to think about it is, I don't think success at the end of the day in implementing continuous availability is a guarantee back to the business of 100% uptime, right? I think this, this transformation is really about changing the economics, right, of, of transitioning OpEx into infrastructure with, with you know, a different model uh, for the infrastructure. I don't think it's necessarily the primary goal just to go back and let's get to 100% uptime guarantee. That's, that's not the goal here. Um, that, that will hopefully be a side effect, a positive side effect, but it's really about just making a big transformation the way stuff has been done in the past. So the transformation is, is the economics, and, and let's touch on that first. So it's, 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 it's cheaper to provide you know, continuous availability is essentially the, the obvious point of this announcement. But the second is that the other piece of the transformation is the, it's not one size fits all a anymore. It's you can tailor the availability services to the business requirement. Is that, uh, am I correct? Is that another part of the transformation or is it too early to, to think in yeah, those terms? Yeah, I, I think it's multifaceted, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, there is an availability angle to this. There's also an asset utilization angle, right? When you put in a continuously available infrastructure, um, you get the benefits of availability, the different model, but now you actually have assets at two locations that you can be using on an active basis. Right, and so when you look at that from an economic standpoint, right, taking a great example we love to talk about is Oracle Rack, right? It's it's a solution that absolutely fits into this model, um, you know, works great with Vplex, and now you have the ability to take workload, mission critical workload, and distribute it between two sites, right? You just took a whole bunch of assets that were sitting there passive, waiting for a failure to happen, and you've been able to put them into the pool of resources. So there, there's a lot more to this than let's just go for that that uptime play. So there's a TCO, there's asset utilization, there's greater flexibility, there's just you know, better IT in general. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's, there's one additional note to this though. For, for me, there's a sort of a, um, a, an atomic level view of this from a, just a business perspective. And it's the idea that, that most of our clients are balancing some level of risk in this decision-making process. It, it, it sort of nets out to some version of risk reward. So uptime at some level of, of you know, assurance is designed to either manage or mitigate some level of risk of being down. So, so as a general rule, what you'll see is different clients and or different customers, to your point, at a very specific level of need, making you know, cost benefit and or risk reward decisions on a regular basis as it relates to what their uptime requirements are. In some instances, there will be a need for very, very little or zero or nominal downtime. In other instances, there's a different level of tolerance, but it all boils down or tracks back to some level of what's my tolerance for risk and or some level of downtime or disruption to, to, to service. So Matt Allen, from an assessment standpoint, what's the, what's the, the, the view of granularity? Is it the application? Is it the business process? Is it the, the linkages between the two? Is it... Is it the degree of interdependencies across the application portfolio? Uh, how do you squint through all that? I, I think it's always, for me anyway, it always maps back to some level of risk associated with fulfillment. So very literally, whatever the organization's objectives are, um, some level of fulfillment as it relates to um, the objectives of that organization, anything that is viewed as a risk or a disruptive element as it relates to execution of transactions or um, you, you know, execution of decisions based on data. Um, anything that maps back to that becomes the driver to this broader continuous availability discussion. Continuous availability becomes very much a 
and it's an oversimplification, but a control to the disruption risk. It's a means of managing a, a risk that's very much about a disruption to services. The, the, the real debate or discussion then becomes, well, do I need to have a certain type of uptime to achieve, to, to literally eliminate or, or more effectively manage the risk? But so I infer that to be a, a business, pro the answer you gave is to me anyway, business process, well, right. however the That's customer right. defines it. That's right. Okay, now, this is where it gets complicated. <laughs> is underneath that business process is, is this, you know, spectrum of applications and IT infrastructure and, and people and other processes. Is part of the assessment to, to dig into those and try to help customers understand that, or is that sort of a, you know a given, and then you're sort of layering your methodology on top of that? That's very much a part of the, the process. Mm -hmm. the, the the intent is to better understand um, you know again some of the, the you know the traditional view of dependency on different applications and or gaps in infrastructure or requirements from both an application and an infrastructure perspective going forward. So those or those gaps or identified issues always have to map back to that business case that, that we were talking about. And so for me, our services, this release and the backdrop to all of it is about how we help our customers manage those gaps and continuous availability is the backbone. And, and, well, Vplex is the back. The and, backbone. and I presume you're charging for these services, right? These I are did. right. There's not a loss leader, right? Okay. So how how do you charge? Is it is it TNM based? Is it sort of you know some percent of the implementation? Or how, how does the customer go about thinking about you know what's this is going to cost? Sure, it's normal consulting services. Yeah. So as a general rule, it's some version of an hourly rate against a you know predefined scope of services that we'll engage in with the customer. We in every instance sit down and make sure we're very clear about the scope of the engagement. We've articulated the timing, tasks, and deliverables, and, and set up pricing accordingly. In some instances, we'll engage with our customers from a time and materials perspective, but as a general rule, it's an assessment service that's designed to give them a sense of scale and scope of what they're going to have to do from a broader roadmap perspective. So it's sort of pricing and what I would call typical assessment service um, so, sort of terms. Okay. And then uh, Matt Waxman had a question on, on VPlex. You mentioned you've been in the market now for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you just give us an update on VPlex? How's it doing? You know, customers, uh, you know, any kind of guidance that you can give us on, on the uptake? And then the use cases and how, how this initiative expands those. Yeah, yeah, so I'd love to give you an update, um, and everyone out there. So uh, we've had phenomenal adoption of, of VPlex. Uh, we have been in market now, like I said, uh, a little over two years. Um, we are in every major vertical in every major geography across the globe. Um, and it really comes down to this core use case of continuous availability. That's what we see the majority of customers, um, you know, using as the, the initial play with VPlex, but there's a ton of other use cases that are resonating well. Um, tech refresh is an obvious one, right? Going in and being able to non-disruptively, you know, refresh your storage infrastructure um, is, is one that every customer deals with, and right? And everyone's looking for an easier solution around that. You get that with VPlex. Um, uh, being able to do workload mobility, right? When we initially launched the product, we talked a lot about vMotion, right? And the ability to pick up a workload and not just move it between two boxes within the data center, but actually do it over long distance. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that use case also fits really well. And, and really, so the conversation is typically, you know, there's a particular business need, continuous availability is a great one to get in the door. But then when it's in, it's in there as an infrastructure, there's just a ton that you can do. And we're seeing that across the board, manufacturing, financial services, healthcare, uh, you name it, you know, they're, they're all love and deplex right now. I want to switch gears a little bit. I know we might, might be going a little long, but I'm just really interested in this topic. Um, so hopefully you guys got a, got a few more minutes you can spend with me. Um, I want to talk about the cloud generally and specifically public cloud and, and Amazon Web Services. We've seen Amazon make a, a big push into the enterprise with the reInvent conference uh, in November, you know, basically going after guys like you. You know, you're, you're the evil empire and they're the savior kind of thing. We love it, right? It's, it's good disruption and good marketing. But at the end of the day, customers have to make a decision. Um, they don't want to act as though you know, Amazon's all bad because then they look like naysayers. So they have to embrace AWS for the right workloads. Um, at the same time, to get a capability as what you're speaking of here out of Amazon, you know, forget it. You'd get, you know, you would need, email us, you know, we'll get back to you kind of thing. And, and that's sort of the, the model. Now that's evolving and there's an ecosystem there, but I'm, my specific question is what are customers telling you guys about the public cloud generally and AWS specifically? Um, 
where do you see that fitting in uh, to a customer's you know portfolio of of choices and and, and in particular how do you see your new capabilities uh, differentiating from that well I, I think the the first answer, and it's a bit of an oversimplification, is kind of stepping back and, and talking about it from helping our customer or our client perspective, understand and or assess the benefits and the risks associated with engaging in or, or engaging a, you know, a, a cloud provider at mm -hmm. one level or another. No, no matter how you cut it, that conversation always maps back to some level of uptime or, or assurance of service or provision of service. Um, that meet certain parameters. And generally speaking, what we found is that not all providers are talking about this in equal terms. In many instances, service level agreements are not meeting what I would I would consider to be good practices, mm -hmm. not best practices, good practices in some of, the, some of that conversation. And right now it appears in large part because of sort, sort of the newness of the provision of services in a broader context to, to the market. And you're specifically talking about the, the, the terms of the cloud service for public cloud. Public yeah. cloud, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and that's non that's non-specific. I mean, that's just... And it's understandable. I mean, they're a huge scale. They're a ton of business risk yeah, sure. and liability sure. that they would have to take on. So you can understand why they don't put that risk in, in writing. That's right. Um, right. But now, the now fact the, is... <laughs> now the demands are there, yeah. and the demands are growing, and that's only going to become more acute as time goes on, and um, we see the marketplace ad adopt continuous availability in, in more regular or uniform fashion. So you'll see the providers having to adhere to some version of that at some level, no matter how you cut it. Yeah, I, I think you know availability is at the core of all of it, right? When you look at the transition to the next wave of applications, right, and all the mobile stuff that we all use every day, Availability is becoming more and more a core part of what we all expect. So wherever that's deployed in the infrastructure, availability is going to and, and is quickly becoming you know, a core tenant of that. So um, you know, a great example, well known publicly, right, was the Netflix outage. Um, outages. Outages. <laughs> outages. Right, yeah, which impacted me sure. personally, which I was very upset about. Um, but, you didn't you know, have Amazon Prime? <laughs> 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 yeah, now do. Yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, it's, it's that level of availability, and, and people think about that as, well, I can tolerate downtime, but um, there's a cost associated with it. And, you know, I think that you'll see these types of technologies and this evolution, whether it's continuous availability in the extreme or not, um, availability is going to be at the core of, of that transition. So the service level agreements that your customers within a private cloud environment can, can offer their internal clients is significantly more stringent, yeah. I would presume, than what you get from a public cloud sure. provider. Plus, they're going to get fired if you know it, sure. it, they have that many outages. So it's just a it's a different world. And I guess I've said, that, look, Amazon's an, another tool in the CIO's toolkit. You know, use it. Right. You know, <laughs> right tool for the right job. Sure. Know? Sure. But uh, and it sounds like you guys would agree with that. But, so. but if if you think about it, and and again, I you know, I, my apologies for constantly sort of trying to, to to boil this to the you know the base level business case. But the reality is, and you know, Matt can I suspect cite chapter and verse the same way. But I don't know. As recently as seven, eight, ten years ago, I've you know would speak at different conferences and and you know make the comment, do you want to be the guy who you know, takes credit for being out for three days. That doesn't happen now. That's right. inconceivable now. We couldn't a dream of a scenario in which you'd have any kind of a material outage. Now it's, you know, fractions of time compared to what we were used to. We've become conditioned to that. And again, that only becomes more acute as, as the business case grows. But the, and I think you guys said something about this in your press release, the, 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 the value, even though it's a sort of minuscule improvement, let's say in terms of the number of nines, right? right? But right. the value of the applications and the data is now so much greater. Yeah. Uh, than it was uh, has been historically, so the numbers are larger, and you're so much more reliant on IT. I think it was the Forrester study that sort of that was one of the key findings, and sort of we all know that. And, and so, when my question is, when you do the business cases, is are you essentially measuring the reduction in expected loss, you know, from an outage? Is that kind of the the, the dollar and cents of this? There's multiple cuts at it, but it's the, it's the um, savings and reduction of loss, but not just savings and reduction of loss, savings and reduction of redundant activities, processes, and technologies. Here, here's the part of the case that for me, I, th I think is missed. Um, no matter how you cut it, especially when you move outside of the IT, uh, the infrastructure stack, there's a ton of business processes and people and, and 
resources and efforts to assure some level of uptime or to assure that there's a continuity of operations. In this instance, with continuous availability, we're offering an alternative to a lot of that redundancy. So we, we can give you, you know, you know, very specific dollar value savings in, in terms of what you no longer spend on, or we can give you dollar value savings in what you are eliminating or the risk you are no longer exposed to. Well, so, I mean, I'm, I'm, relu I'm reluctant to say that's one's hard dollar, one's soft dollar, because if you go down, you know, website's down and you can't take orders, that's hard dollars. But there's, the, let's call it IT savings, right, in terms of redundant processes and procedures and hardware and software. And then there's the sort of business impact, um, which I would think is telephone numbers, comparatively speaking, but it's a harder sell to the CFO, presumably. That, that, that's right. But again, I, I think in that instance, there's a constant balance between the risk, risk reward or the cost benefit decision here. And as a general rule, I'm finding more and more within the IT organization, no one wants to be that guy. Right. No one wants to be the guy that said, well, we saved a few dollars here. Yeah, but we had a little bit right. of, we, we had a little bit of outage last last year during during the holidays. And, and frankly, um, no one wants to be that guy because that guy won't have a job. Very well. <laughs> the, the reality is they've got to find a way to come up with solutions that are, uh, I think, a much more compelling story from a cost benefit perspective, specifically as it relates to uptime. Uptime is the, the compelling driver now in a way that it, it never has been in the past. Right. All right, Matt, Wax Matt Waxman, last word. Um, maybe just you know, summarize your thoughts, and then we got a break. Uh, yeah, I, I first really appreciate the time. I, I think it's a great opportunity. Um, what we've built here, at, you know, both as a company and just shift in the industry, I think is really revolutionary. And you know, we're seeing customers ad adopted in, in droves, right? And so um, I just expect uh, a lot, a lot of interest in this. I think uh, this is the tip of the iceberg. And uh, you'll see a lot more coming down the pipe, too. Well, gentlemen, Matt Waxman, Matt Allen, thanks very much for coming on The Cube. Uh, really appreciate everybody watching. This is Dave Vellante. This is The Cube. Thanks, you, and uh, we'll see you next time.